So to start with, let me explain how smart connected products can be built using WC IoT platform. Amazon Dash button is allowing us to rethink how we create our shopping list. The one that we used to create in a piece of paper is now a digitized thing where whenever we want a particular item, we just press the button and we get added in our shopping list. August Smart Lock is defining a new way for us to give access to the locks, to the doors. Where we used to use a key, now this is being taken by a piece of code that you enter, and it literally redefines how we can share access to a door compared to giving it to a key to somebody versus just allowing their phone app to access that lock. Or else, this particular device, the inhaler from this particular vendor, is actually measuring how much of dosage that goes into your lungs and how long you can use this puff so that you can place the orders on behalf of you. And this Rebecca Minkoff shop uh, in New York is actually allowing you to go to a changing room, rather fit on room, right? and then figure out what are the other sizes of a particular item that you have taken in, available, in case the item that you have taken in is not the correct size. And my final connected example is this particular truck that is operating in uh, Australia. There are 73 such trucks that have, close, that have moved close to 1 billion material, fully automated. They have been in operation for like the last three, hour, three years. So these smart connected products are disrupting the businesses as we see. Or if I am to use Paul's term, they are adapting businesses into new heights. And they require, they or rather they demand, us to rethink how products should be made so that they can be connected, they can be smart, so that they will redefine the businesses. Doing this is rather a challenging task. To start with, creating a connected product at the level of hardware manufacturing involves certain things like uh, registering device. For example, like you could be creating a device, and device may need to have a certain ID. So at the point of manufacturing the device, you might have to embed that particular ID into the device. Or you might want to integrate with certain C services, like, uh, for example, if you take the Nest, Nest is supposed to talk to a couple of other weather services out there to understand the environment. So there's service integration that happens at the point of device being manufactured. Or else, when we go to the next stage where you have the device, and now you're trying to create firmware or applications to be running on top of it, that phase also introduces certain challenges like uh, how to create ap applications firmware and how to distribute that, right? And also how to distribute that over the air once the while the device is in operation. And once the device is being used, right, it creates things like managing large amount of events uh, and uh, managing ownership between different owners. And also at the monitoring level also, there are a lot of challenges, like uh, how you share certain part of the device data to certain part of individuals or different business entities. So let me tell you how to overcome some of those challenges and build smart connected products. So I'm going to present you with a high-level architecture for doing this. Before that, 
what you have to realize is IoT deployments are drastically different to a traditional server-side deployment. In the server-side deployment, you only have a, a server-side part of it. Whereas when it comes to IoT deployments, there are devices running pieces of code that you write. And those devices are distributed. And you can't easily access it most of the time because you, do, you probably don't know where those devices are, unlike in the server side of case. And typically, these deployments fall under these three categories. The one in the uh, left-hand corner, basically, the devices are having their own communication capabilities so that they can connect into a cloud with the piece of software that is running inside there. I call it the agent. The pattern in the middle is using a separate communication gateway to call the server-side cloud. And the pattern here is actually having some processing capability so that it can do some edge computing or fog computing before the data reaches the cloud. These are the three most common patterns. And in the case of fog computing, this, this can actually come to a complicated hierarchy. And this is a reference architecture that we have developed three years ago for IoT. There's a white paper written by Paul, the keynote speaker yesterday, our CTO. This reference architecture captures most of the functional components that are required to build an IoT architecture. And it's the same arch reference architecture that we have followed when we are building the WS2 IoT server. So we have the devices first. And those devices will have an agent that is capable of connecting to our server-side runtime. And that agent can also have an edge computing capability so that it's not a dumb agent that is just collecting data from the device or receiving commands from the server side, but rather it can do some computing on its own. And those devices get connected into a server side platform that are having some essential components like uh, being able to authenticate and authorize, being able to receive different device communications via different protocols, and uh, being able to under, uh, identify between different types of devices, and doing analytics. So once these devices reach a server-side platform, there can be many usages of those devices that are now already connecting to a server-side platform. One could be that you want to write applications against the data or the devices that, that you have connected to. Or else you might want to integrate that with some other devices, some other systems rather, okay? so that it's device integration, simply. Or else you might want to control some other devices using inputs from those devices. Or else uh, develop various system applications. So let me go back to the topic, which is building a smart connected device, and try to explain how WSO2 platform can be used to build something like that. So I'm thinking of taking this journey uh, through an example, and it's called building a connected locker. So this is going to be the basis for the tutorial tomorrow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a couple of important steps that you should be considering when building this connected smart product. So to start with, let me explain you the, uh, the, the high-level solution architecture. So this particular device that you see here is actually here. It's, uh, it will not be working today because it's not connected, uh, but it will be working tomorrow. So we have this particular device. And this guy is having an 
SDK inside and an agent that is running in here, which is connecting to the IoT platform. And there's a web application that we have developed so that we can uh, perform various functions on top of this locker. So this is having a keypad. It's rather messy. Uh, and what you have inside here is a couple of things assembled. Right? Let me just explain for those of you who are into hardware. So uh, first of all, we have this uh, door sensor. I don't have a pointer here. OK. Uh, we have this door sensor that is right on the top. And there's a solenoid lock. We are using a ESP node, ESP8266 node MCU as the heart of this particular device. That is the one that is running the agent. Anybody who has played with ESP8266? OK. Oh, yes, OK. This is the same chipset. Then uh, to control that keypad, there's a keypad driver, uh, a relay module to, uh, because the Relay is, the solenoid is actually using 12 volts. The rest of the components are operating on 5 volts. Uh, there's a temperature sensor. There's an IR sensor and a metal detector. So the scenario that I'm trying to show tomorrow is uh, you can actually figure out when the lock is open using the door sensor. Right? You can actually figure out whether there's anything inside using the IR sensor. IR sensor is somewhere here. Right? Then you can actually figure out whether what is inside here is metal or not. And you can also monitor the temperature and the humidity inside using the DHT sensor. The schematic is here. I'll share it later on. Okay. So to start with, now this particular device needs to be connected. Okay. In this case, this module that I'm using is Wi-Fi capable. So because of that, there aren't that many challenges. It's just a matter of like booting up a Wi-Fi hotspot and allowing it to connect. But there can be various other protocols at different levels that you might have to deal with. So to explain how that can be done using WSL platform, I thought of bringing up this particular example that you have done for a different client. So in their case, they had this Android-powered TV box in a certain environment. Okay? And they want, they, they already had this, right? They want this particular device to be used as a gateway to enhance the environment that they're having. So that their environment had uh, certain window blind controllers, certain light controllers, uh, heating controllers, right? Now, in, in that case, what we did was, this TV box had this USB capability. So we used a Zigbee Explorer here. And then on the other side, we had this Zigbee Shield connected to a relay module so that we can control the rest of the devices. The difference here is there are two protocols that are involved. Here, it's uh, the wireless. The Zigbee was being used there. And there, it has a Wi-Fi connection between the IoT server and the TV box. So uh, for example, like uh, I have done a pet project where I've, I've been using the IoT server to control a quadcopter. In that case, I had to uh, plug in a, a RC module into the USB uh, port so that I can actually convert the software commands into radio signals. So it depends on whatever the communication mechanism that you want to implement. So let me move on with the connector locker. In order for the locker to connect, the agent that is running inside the uh, device to connect, it needs to understand some of the, rather, you need to understand some of the capabilities that we have within the server side. So we call that the device management core. So it has capabilities like uh, device management. So uh, basically being able to keep a registry of devices, being able to understand when certain devices are failing, being able to group the devices, being able to manage users and ma keep the identity between the devices and the users. So 
those type of capabilities are embedded in this device management core. And like Paul said yesterday, all of these capabilities are 100% API driven. So if you download the product, you would see a UI, but that UI is being used by, is using this API. So you can actually get rid of the UI and uh, completely use the IoT platform as an API. And some of the prominent APIs are group management API, uh, configuration, certificate management API, policy, device management, and user management APIs, all exposed as REST APIs, auth protected and managed REST APIs using WSO2's API management capabilities. Okay. So to start with, start connecting this particular agent into the server side, you first of all need to obtain a token, auth token. So Obtaining those tokens are also exposed as APIs. So it's just, uh, these are curl examples that I'm showing, but uh, what, is, what you need to understand is these highlighted URLs, which are the endpoints available on the server. So first of all, you obtain the OAuth token, and then you need to tell the system that there's a device of type locker. Okay. So, we have built in this particular concept called device type so that you can actually do an API call and introduce a device type into the server. Right? So this device type, what I've done is I have actually taken the JSON that is here and formatted there, has three main sections. The top section is the properties. Basically, those are attributes that the particular device is having. The second section is operations. We call them features. Those reflect the various capabilities that a particular device could be having, like opening the lock or turning on a light. The last, con last section is the communication medium that the device will be using. In this case, it's MQTT. So uh, in a way, the device can be explained as a set of sensors, set of actuators, and a man management interface. That is quite in alignment with what, uh, what was presented in two keynotes yesterday about APIs, events, and streams. And this registering the device type can also be done using the UI, but it's rather limiting. Uh, the API is much more powerful. So once you register a device type, you have to tell the type of events that this particular device type would be sending. So that is why this event registration API is there. So that you tell the system this particular device can send these type of events. So once you have the events, and once you have the device type defined, the next thing that you have to do is, you have to allow an instance of device like this to connect into the IoT platform. Now there's an IoT platform that is aware of a device type called lock, right? And what you would do is you would just give this to somebody and ask them to register this particular device type. Typically, in the industry, there are four device provisioning mechanisms. There could be many, but I think these fall under, all those fall under these categories. The first one is the keys and the certificates, or the certificates being burned into the hardware that you manufacture, so that the hardware it tells, itself takes care of sending the certificate on the key when it wants to connect to a certain platform. Or the second type is you do it at the firmware level, which is pretty much equivalent to what we have done here. The agent actually takes care of obtaining an OAuth token and sending it for each and every communication between the server side. The fourth approach is called TPM. These, these are separate set of uh, chipsets or modules that you can put on top of your hardware so that they take care of the security part of it. The fourth approach of provisioning is getting a user to do this. Uh, basically, like uh, uh, asking the user maybe for a mobile number and sending part of the code that he needs to enter into the device. If you have enrolled a Nest thermostat, you would like probably see a similar pattern. Okay? So in our case, this particular locker is just using the simple enrollment API and just telling 
this is the access token that it has received before, and telling uh, I'm of the device type locker, and my device identifier is 1234, that is a unique identifier for that particular device instance, and a couple of other properties. So this API call helps the system to uniquely identify a particular device instance that is having the ID 1234. So if it is a chip-enabled ID, you can actually get it here. Once you have the uh, device enrolled, this is the application part of it. Like, so I told you that there's a web application that is doing the same thing, so that you don't have to do all these API calls. So this particular locker application is coming up with an example web application, so that you can actually uh, add a locker. So it will ask you the same things, the name, the uh, ID, and the description of the particular device. So for example, you could be having five lockers at your home, right? so that you can enter a different description or a name, so that you can identify these the locker here, there, etc. So once you have the device connected to the server, there are two ways of communications that can happen. Either the server can push data into the device, which is an example that is being here. So basically, in this case, uh, it's a HTTP call that we are doing uh, to the device so that it actually goes into MQTT topic. And the device is actually subscribed into MQTT topic so that it will receive the command. This is another example that is pretty much related to the uh, device. And from the device, the other, other side of it, the device can send its sensor data when the lock is, when the, when the door is open, when the temperature is changing, right? Uh, when somebody ins inserts a metal item, those events can send it to the server side. In that case, they are using an HTTP API because the device is capable of doing a HTTP call on this particular hardware and there are server-side APIs that we have done to receive those events. So what we have right now is the device sending data into the server-side, which brings us to this particular topic, how to deal with the data, the stream of data that is coming into the system in a connected product scenario. So things that we can do with the incoming data generally falls under several categories. One is you can do real-time analytics. You can understand what is happening in the real time and do various things. Or else you can batch it. So for example, you can store certain lock access patterns and have it projected later on. Or else you can push it into a predictive analytics engine so that you can do various predictions. Okay. So we support all of these scenarios using WC2 Analytics Platform, which is being presented as a stream processor. There's a separate track on that. Okay. So there's an integration between the IoT platform to this particular engine so that the data received from the device, the connected device, can actually be processed. So in the case of uh, real-time streaming, some of the examples that we support here are uh, Understanding lock anomaly and anom lock usage anomalies. Like there's an object inside the lock, uh, lock, but the door is open for a significant amount of time. Somebody has forgotten to close the door, or else it could be that the temperature or humidity changes suddenly, yeah. or else it could be that uh, you are not allowed to put metal items inside, but somebody places in the metal item. Now, the thing is, like most of these scenarios needs to be dealt with in a very quick way, okay? which is where the real-time analytics comes into the picture. The other approach is doing things like batch processing so that, for example, you might want to store how the lock key is being accessed in a database table so that you can project it in a separate page later on. And how we deal with this is there's an event flow uh, within the, within the uh, analytics engine so that basically you can plug in various things 
I think the fonts, some of the fonts are not clear, but you can plug in various logic. Say, for example, what you have here is three things that are, one is dealing with alerts, the other one dealing with the, the, the uh, batch analytics part. So that you have separate scripts doing separate things. The real-time analytics part is being done by the Siddhi, whereas the batch analytics is being done by Apache Sparks. So once you have all of these data collected, there's no point if you don't share or exchange and do something with that data. That is where the API management capabilities come in. So with the WSO API management capabilities, we have the full capability of building a full-fledged API market space. And in this particular example, uh, this whole web application that we have around this example is done using those APIs. And if you're familiar with the WSO API manager, this the API detail page. Uh, it's not very clear, but uh, this basically reflects the locker and you can, what are the operations that you can perform with this. And not related to this, but there are a couple of other built-in capabilities, so I thought of like picking up several. One is things that we support built-in for geolocation type of things. Basically, you can identify various uh, uh, devices with their uh, geolocation and do things like geotagging, applying geofences, right? or generating alerts, or creating dynamic groups. That's a built-in capability. And you can even embed the particular UI that you saw here in one of your web applications. There's an API, like, I have, like for all these things. And then we are incrementally working on getting support for edge and for computing, because that seems to be the future with IoT, simply because uh, with the large number of devices coming in, you simply can't allow all those devices to communicate to a single server-side platform, or rather scale server-side platform, because that is not going to uh, scale, one thing, and people are increasingly for worried about their privacy, so that they don't want to like send all their uh, like uh, private data all the way into a cloud, but rather they would process it locally within a confined environment and just send the anonymized data uh, for cloud for various purposes. So we are actually offering the Siddhi capability packaged with uh, Android at this point, but we are working on uh, redefining what you want to do here. So you would hopefully see a lot of updates on this particular space. And we also have quite a f amount of expertise on dealing with Android-powered devices. So these don't fall under the mobile devices, but rather different devices that are being powered by Android, like uh, various uh, tablets, uh, then like uh, uh, various payment devices, various things. So this actually brings me to the end of this particular session. And uh, I want to reiterate on uh, what was presented yesterday on APIs, events, and streams. So in the case of APIs, what was mentioned yesterday was APIs are used to control things. And events are being used for random notifications, like somebody placing in a metal object inside the locker is an event that is directly associated with what you call the event-driven architecture. Then the streams, a continuous feed of events that a particular device may be sending, which needs to be separately processed. So I want to finish this talk with the message that we are capable of dealing with WSO2 platform, is capable of dealing with all these three types of communications. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Uh, the pattern that you showed, the example, smart lock, yeah. which pattern does it fall into out of the three patterns you showed in the beginning slide? Um, so it's actually, it falls into the device is capable of directly communicating on its own. It's the first pattern. And uh, is this also in the roadmap that the uh, WSO2 IoT server will have some uh, smart edge firmware? Yes. 
we, 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 already have, uh, we already have the edge processing capabilities on top of Android. So Siddhi is already plugged into Android. So uh, say, for example, if you, if you have an Android-powered device, you can actually get uh, that installed. And if that device is capable of receiving various events, you can do uh, various processings on top of that Android device. What's the footprint of the executable? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I have to check. I, otherwise, I'll be giving a... Thanks. Yeah, thanks. OK, uh, so next we have Chatura Kulasinga. Chatura is actually part of our solution architecture team. Uh, maybe some of you guys have already worked with him. He's based in UK, and he has uh, been working with various clients to provide various solutions to their problems using all WC2 components. And he's going to talk about a couple of use cases where customers are using WC2 IoT server to solve their device integration challenges. And most of these will be in, presented in uh, anonymized format. Uh, but I believe we have a couple of public uh, cases as well. Thank you. Over to Chatra.